Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina and welcome to my lecture on renal and urinary tract disorders of pregnancy. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine. Here's a reference for my lecture. It's William Substetrics, 25th edition, chapter 53, Renal and Urinary Tract Disorders. And this is the outline of my lecture. So when you go back to the chapter in William Substetrics, you will note that this is such a long chapter. So I just chose those which are uh, more important for this lecture. So first, let's review some pregnancy-induced urinary tract changes. So during pregnancy, kidneys become larger and the calyces and the ureters dilate. And this is mainly because of a progesterone-induced relaxation of the muscularis. There's also marked dilatation that is apparent beginning in mid-pregnancy because of the more distal ureteral compression, especially on the right side. There's also vesico-ureteral reflux during pregnancy. Because of these physiological changes, the risk of upper urinary infection is increased. Also, imaging studies done to evaluate the urinary tract obstruction may occasionally be erroneously interpreted. So during pregnancy, glomeruli are larger, although cell numbers do not grow. And there's pregnancy-induced intrarenal vasodilatation that develops and both afferent and efferent resistances decline. And this leads to greater effective renal plasma flow and glomerular filtration. So first, let's talk about asymptomatic bacteriuria. And this is a persistent, actively multiplying bacteria within the urinary tract in asymptomatic women. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, as well as the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, recommend screening for asymptomatic bacteriuria at the first prenatal visit. An initial positive urine culture result done as a part of prenatal care should prompt treatment. So to diagnose this, we need a clean voided specimen containing more than 100,000 organisms per ml, which is diagnostic of asymptomatic bacteriuria. It may be prudent to treat when lower concentrations are identified because pyelonephritis develops in some women despite colony counts of only 20,000 to 50,000 organisms per ml. Most studies indicate that if asymptomatic bacteriuria is not treated, Approximately 25% of infected women will develop symptomatic infection during pregnancy. And here's the treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria. As you can see here, we have the single dose treatment, the 3 day course, and the 7 to 10 day course. So we can use amoxicillin 3 grams, ampicillin 2 grams, cephalosporin 2 grams, nitrofurantoin 200 milligrams, and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. 320, 1,600 milligrams single dose. That's for the single dose treatment. For the 3 day course, we can use amoxicillin, ampicillin, cephalosporin, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, nitrofurantoin, and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. For recurrent bacteria, we can give nitrofurantoin 100 milligrams orally at bedtime for 21 days. For women with persistent or frequent bacteriuria recurrences, we can do suppressive therapy for the remainder of pregnancy, and we can also give nitrofurantoin 100 mg orally at bedtime. This drug may rarely cause an acute pulmonary reaction that dissipates on its withdrawal. Next is acute pyelonephritis. So this is usually a unilateral and right-sided in more than half of cases, and it is bilateral in a fourth of cases. This manifests as fever with shaking chills, aching pain in one or both lumbar regions. Tenderness usually can be elicited by percussion in one or both costa vertebral angles. And this is what we call the costa vertebral angle tenderness. The differential diagnosis for acute pyelonephritis includes, among others, labor, chorioamunitis, adnexal torsion, appendicitis, placental abruptio, or infarcted myoma. Etiology for acute pyelonephritis include the following. It's usually E. coli in 70-80% to 80 of cases, but there can also be the involvement of Klebsiella, pneumonia, Enterobacter or Proteus species, and Group B strep or Staph aureus. So how do we treat acute pyelonephritis? Intravenous hydration to ensure adequate urinary output is the cornerstone of treatment. Antimicrobials are begun promptly, but they may initially worsen on the endotoxemia from bacterial lysis. 
Surveillance for worsening sepsis syndrome includes serial monitoring of urinary output, blood pressure, pulse, temperature, and oxygen saturation. High fevers are lowered with a cooling blanket and acetaminophen or paracetamol. And this is very important because in early pregnancy, there, there's this possibility of teratogenicity from hyperthermia. Antimicrobial therapy usually is empirical. We can give ampi plus gentamicin, cefazolin or cetriaxone, or extended spectrum antibiotics. So this is a table showing to us the outline of how to manage pregnant women with acute pyelonephritis. So of course, we have to admit or hospitalize the patient. We obtain urine and possibly blood cultures, evaluate the hemogram, serum creatinine in electrolytes, monitor the vital signs frequently, including urinary output, of course, establish urinary output at greater than 50 ml per hour with intravenous crystalloid solution, administer IV antimicrobial therapy, obtain chest radiograph if there is dyspnea or tachypnea, repeat hematology and chemistry studies in 48 hours, change to oral antimicrobials when a febrile, discharge when a febrile for 24 hours, and consider antimicrobial therapy for 7 to 10 days, and of course, repeat the urine culture one to two weeks after antimicrobial therapy is completed. Next, we discuss nephrolithiasis. Although calcium oxalate stones in young non-pregnant women are most common, most stones in pregnancy, 65 to 75% that is, are calcium phosphate or hydroxyapatite. Pregnant women may have fewer symptoms with stone passage because of physiologic urinary tract dilatation during pregnancy, and more than 90% of pregnant women with symptomatic nephrolithiasis present with pain. Gross hematuria is less common than in affected non-pregnant women. Sonography or ultrasound is usually selected to visualize the stones, but many are not detected because of hydronephrosis in pregnancy that may obscure the findings. Transabdominal color Doppler sonography can detect presence or absence of urethral jets of urine into the bladder, and this may exclude obstruction. How do we treat nephrolithiasis? So the cor one of the cornerstones of treatment, of course, is intravenous hydration and analgesics. Urinary obstruction with concomitant infection is an emergency, and this is what we call pus under pressure. Approximately 65 to 80 percent of symptomatic women will improve with conservative therapy, and the stone usually passes spontaneously. Others require an invasive procedures such as urethral stenting ureteroscopy, percutaneous nephrostomy, transurethral laser lithotripsy, or basket extraction. ESWL, or what we call the extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, is contraindicated in pregnancy. So next, we talk about the glomerular diseases. Lewis and Nelson group glomerular injuries into six syndromes based on clinical patterns. So we have the acute nephritic syndrome, pulmonary renal syndrome, nephrotic syndrome, basement membrane syndrome, glomerular vascular syndrome, and infectious disease-associated syndromes. So we'll discuss some of these only. So first, the acute nephritic syndrome. The clinical presentation of this usually includes hypertension, hematuria, red cell cast, pyuria, and proteinuria. There's varying degrees of renal insufficiency and salt and water retention that result in edema, hypertension, and circulatory congestion. The prognosis and treatment of nephritic syndrome depends on their etiology because some recede spontaneously or with treatment. In some patients, rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis leads to end-stage renal failure, whereas in others, chronic glomerular nephritis develops with slowly progressive renal disease. Lupus nephritis identified before pregnancy has a 50% chance of flaring during pregnancy. IgA nephropathy, also known as Berger's disease, is the most common form of acute glomerular nephritis worldwide. The isolated form occurs sporadically, and it may be related to Hinoxion lane purpura as a systemic form. Isolated nephritis may be due to anti-glomerular basement membrane or anti-GBM antibodies. This may also involve the lungs to manifest as a pulmonary renal syndrome with alveolar hemorrhage, which is termed good pasture syndrome. During pregnancy, acute nephritic syndromes can be difficult to differentiate from severe preeclampsia or eclampsia. 
In some of these cases, renal biopsy is sometimes needed to determine etiology and direct management. Now, whatever the underlying etiology, acute glomerulonephritis has profound effects on pregnancy outcome. And the most frequent lesions on biopsy were membranous glomerulonephritis, IgA glomerulonephritis, and diffuse mesangial glomerulonephritis. The worst perinatal outcomes are expected in women with impaired renal function, early or severe hypertension, and nephrotic range proteinuria. Pregnancy outcome is related to the degree of renal insufficiency and hypertension. So next we discuss nephrotic syndrome. This is characterized by heavy proteinuria, which is the hallmark of nephrotic syndrome. This results from several primary and secondary kidney disorders that cause immunological or toxin-mediated injury with glomerular capillary wall breakdown to allow excessive filtration of plasma proteins. This is characterized by hypoalbuminemia, hypercholesterolemia, and edema, and there frequently is hypertension, albumin nephrotoxicity, and renal insufficiency. Frequent causes of nephrotic syndrome are minimal change disease, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, membrane glomerulonephritis, and diabetic nephropathy. In most cases, renal biopsy will disclose microscopic abnormalities that may help direct treatment. Normal amounts of dietary protein of high biological value are encouraged. The incidence of thromboembolism is increased and varies with the severity of hypertension, proteinuria, and renal insufficiency. Nephrotic syndrome may develop arterial and venous thrombosis and renal vein thrombosis. The value, however, of prophylactic anticoagulation is still unclear. Some cases of nephrosis from primary glomerular disease respond to glucocorticoids and other immunosuppressants or cytotoxic drug therapy. In most of those cases caused by infection or drugs, proteinuria recedes when the underlying cause is corrected. During pregnancy, maternal and perinatal outcomes in women with nephrotic syndrome depend on its underlying cause and severity. Now, some women with nephrotic range proteinuria will have a rise in daily protein excretion as pregnancy progresses. The management of edema during pregnancy can be particularly challenging as it is intensified by normally increasing hydrostatic pressure in the lower extremities and massive vulvar edema may develop. And up to half of these pregnant women have chronic hypertension that may require treatment. Preeclampsia is common among pregnant women with nephrotic syndrome and often develops early during pregnancy. Most women with nephrotic syndrome who do not have severe hypertension or renal insufficiency will have successful pregnancy outcomes. Conversely, if there is renal insufficiency, moderate to severe hypertension or both, the prognosis is so much worse. Serum creatinine level of greater than 1.4 mg per deciliter and 24-hour protein excretion of more than 1 gram per day are associated with the shortest renal survival times during pregnancy. So next we talk about chronic kidney disease. This is a pathophysiological process that can progress to end-stage renal disease. The National Kidney Foundation describes six stages of chronic kidney disease defined by decreasing GFR. So we have stage 0 with a GFR of greater than 90 ml per minute per 1.73 meters squared up to the worst which is stage 5 where you have a GFR which is less than 15 ml per minute per 1.73 meters squared. Those that most frequently lead to end-stage renal disease requiring dialysis and kidney transplantation include the following. So those who are diabetic, hypertensive, those with glomerulonephritis, and polycystic kidney disease. To counsel regarding fertility and pregnancy outcomes, the degree of renal functional impairment and of associated hypertension are assessed. A general prognosis can be estimated by considering women with chronic renal disease in arbitrary categories of renal function. So, we have normal or mild impairment defined as a serum crea less than 1.5 mg per deciliter, Moderate impairment defined as serum crea less than or 1.5 to 3 mg per deciliter. And severe renal insufficiency defined as a serum creatinine greater than 3 mg per deciliter. 
So most women have relatively mild renal insufficiency for those uh, pregnant women with chronic renal disease. And its severity, along with any underlying hypertension, is prognostic of pregnancy outcome. Renal disease with comorbidities secondary to a systemic disorder such as diabetes or SLE portends a worse prognosis. For all women with chronic renal disease, the incidences of hypertension and preeclampsia, preterm, and growth-restricted newborns and other problems are very, very high. Loss of renal tissue is associated with compensatory intrarenal vasodilatation and hypertrophy of the surviving nephrons. The resultant hyperperfusion and hyperfiltration eventually damage surviving nephrons to cause nephrosclerosis and worsening renal function. With mild renal insufficiency, pregnancy causes greater augmentation of renal plasma flow and GFR. With progressively declining renal function, there is little augmented renal plasma flow. Importantly, severe chronic renal insufficiency curtails normal pregnancy-induced hypervolemia. Blood volume expansion during pregnancy is related to disease severity and correlates inversely with serum creatinine concentration. With severe renal insufficiency, however, volume expansion averages only 25%, which is similar to that seen with hemoconcentration from eclampsia. In addition, these women have variable degrees of chronic anemia due to intrinsic renal disease. In women with chronic kidney disease who also have renal insufficiency, adverse outcomes are generally directly related to the degree of renal impairment. Frequent monitoring of blood pressure is very important. Serum CREA levels, protein CREA ratio, and 24-hour protein excretion are very important. Bacteriuria is treated to decrease the risk of pyelonephritis and further nephron loss. Protein-rich diets are highly recommended. Some women with anemia, we can give recombinant erythropoietin. However, hypertension is a common side effect. Serial sonography is performed to follow fetal, fetal growth. How about the long-term effects of chronic renal insufficiency? For some women, pregnancy may accelerate chronic renal disease progression by increasing hyperfiltration and glomerular pressure to worsen nephrosclerosis. Chronic proteinuria is also a marker for subsequent development of renal failure. How about dialysis during pregnancy? Dialysis during pregnancy is recommended when serum CREA levels are between 5 and 7 mg per deciliter. Because it is imperative to avoid abrupt volume changes that cause hypotension, dialysis frequency may be extended to 5 to 6 times weekly. It is important to replace substances that are lost through dialysis. Multivitamin doses are doubled and calcium and iron salts are provided along with sufficient dietary protein and calories. Chronic anemia is treated with erythropoietin. To meet pregnancy changes, extra calcium is added to the dialysate along with less bicarbonate. Maternal complications are common and include severe hypertension, placental abruptio, heart failure, and sepsis. There is very high incidence of maternal hypertension and anemia, preterm and growth-restricted infants, stillbirths, and hydramnios. Now we talk about acute kidney injury. And this is previously termed as acute renal failure. Now, the term acute kidney injury is now used to describe suddenly impaired kidney function with retention of nitrogenous and other waste products normally excreted by the kidneys. Acute renal ischemia is still often associated with severe preeclampsia and hemorrhage. Then uh, we have HELP syndrome as contributory, also placental abruptio, and septicemia. Acute kidney injury is also common among women with acute fatty liver of pregnancy. How do we diagnose and manage acute kidney injury? In most women, AKI develops postpartum, thus management is usually not complicated by fetal considerations. An abrupt rise in serum CREA level is most often due to renal ischemia. Oliguria is an important sign, and severe hypo, hypovolemia from massive hemorrhage is common, and pre-existent renal ischemia from preeclampsia is often a comorbid. When azotemia is evident and severe oliguria persists, some form of renal replacement treatment is indicated.
So hemofiltration or dialysis is initiated before marked deterioration occurs. Medication doses are adjusted such as magnesium sulfate, iodinated contrast agents, aminoglycosides, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Early dialysis appears to reduce the maternal mortality rate. And with time, renal function usually returns to normal or near normal. How do we prevent AKI? AKI in obstetrics is most often due to acute blood loss, especially that associated with preeclampsia. Thus, it may often be prevented by the following. So first is prompt and vigorous volume replacement with crystalloid solutions and blood in instances of massive hemorrhage such as in placental abruption, placenta previa, uterine rupture, and postpartum uterine atony. Second, delivery or or termination of pregnancies complicated by severe preeclampsia or eclampsia, and careful blood transfusion if loss is more than average. Third, close observation for early signs of sepsis syndrome and shock in women with pyelonephritis, septic abortion, chorionmenitis, or sepsis from other pelvic infections. Fourth, avoidance of loop diuretics to treat oliguria before ensuring that blood volume and cardiac output are adequate for renal perfusion and lastly, judicious use of vasoconstrictor drugs to treat hypotension and only after it has been determined that pathological vasodilatation is the cause. So, in summary, here's the outline of what we uh, have discussed. So, we talked about uh, asymptomatic bacteriuria, acute pyelonephritis, nephrolithiasis, glomerular diseases, chronic kidney disease, chronic renal insufficiency, and lastly, acute kidney injury. That's it for my lecture and thank you for watching and please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and WordPress site. Thank you!